This unit will teach you to estimate gross single turbine annual electricity production, or AEP, from basic first principles. One of the nice things about offshore wind energy is that it is far, far easier to estimate the potential annual energy production of a single turbine, considered alone, if you know where it's going, and the model of turbine, than it would be to estimate the production of, say, an oil well in the same location. Yeah, the latter, just forget about it. There's not really standardized mass-produced models of offshore oil platforms, and you can't just stick a pin on a map, even a researched oil resource map, and know roughly what annual production would be there. It takes a lot of expensive, proprietary data, interdisciplinary teamwork, time analysis, and guesstimation. Not to say that real-world wind project appraisal doesn't require that rigour, especially when companies are thinking about spending billions. But, at this beginner's course's high level of scoping economics, meaning initial scanning for candidate wind sites, not the full-blown kind of investment due diligence done by multidisciplinary teams on live projects, it's not that hard to make a credible estimate of gross single turbine AEP. It's not going to be a hole in one, but it will get you at least somewhere respectably close on the putting green with a defensible and transparent starting point. It's easier with wind because, crucially, credible estimates for location specific data for a key input, namely mean wind speeds, don't require drilling to get an idea of. It's much easier to measure and so extrapolate from. So you end up having industry credible starting point estimates freely available online from the likes of the Global Wind Atlas or Procurnicus. So here you'll see how to plug in this relatively accessible mean wind speed data into a formula used in an Excel approach to quickly get you from annual wind to annual watts. To look at wind speeds as a time series, like we do here, where the week in the box in the top monthly chart is shown in full in the bottom weekly chart, you might wonder how you'd ever hope to model something so moody. At the even finer resolution of one day, scrolling through a few of them, it just looks pretty random. Well, it would when you look at the data that way. It's better to look at the patterns that show up after at least a year. This shows the patterns, or distributions, of how many hours the wind blew at different speeds in two places over 2018. In either case, if you stacked all the columns of a certain colour, they'd total to 24 times 365, or 8,760 hours. In general, the more the distribution spreads out to cover the higher wind speeds to the right, the more you'll generate. Both of those shapes showed a type of recognized statistical distribution called a viable distribution. Here's another on its own. The useful thing is, if you know a site's mean wind speed, you'll see you can wire that up to basically two short formulas to estimate or simulate a full annual curve for that site. Basically, you're simulating 8,760 hours of wind. Now, if you've never done statistics, no problem. We show you what little you need. If, on the other hand, you've done simulation in Excel using third-party add-ins or in R or Python, etc., you'll instantly recognize and follow this. But still, you might not have seen how to do it all macro-free in native Excel as we do here so that everyone can do all the exercises. Now, where this gets interesting is when you put a wind turbine of a certain spec into that environment. These specs are represented by this red line called a power curve. It shows how much instantaneous power is produced at different instantaneous wind speeds. Basically, any wind blowing at speeds between these two points cause generation. And so ideally, you'd want all of it to be at the higher speeds which correspond to this max generation plateau. We can see this because once you have these two lined up, 
It's one simple math step to get what matters to us. Gross annual generation, here just a shorthand term for AEP, shown by the data label at the end of the black line. When the mean wind speed increases, guess what happens? It makes intuitive sense, but it's really nice to be able to quantify it from first principles. Once you've been walked through the basics, it'll be your turn. Given some assumed mean wind speeds for different sites, you'll need to pick, amongst competing turbines of given sizes, the best ones. That is, the ones with the highest gross EEP. This is no mere game, people. The stakes are actually quite high. Your choice's resultant gross AEP numbers will feed straight into the case study model in Unit 5. Now, if you've never done this sort of thing, you might feel daunted. You shouldn't. Honest, this truly falls into the category of easy once you know how. The unit structure is like this turbine tower ladder, a lot of step-by-step -step sections with resting points. Actually, by the time you're done, you'll realise that that light there at the end of the tower wasn't even really that far away to begin with. We make sure you always know where you are in the process and where you're going. Although not needed for the main case study exercise, we cover some extra wind resource related topics, including how to estimate how changing the height of a single turbine's rotor hub impacts wind speed, and thus AEP. You'll see this partially from your own observations, which, as you fill in the blanks, will make some ready and waiting charts update. It's like getting an M&M &M at the end of each one. Yep. And you'll then see a formula which explains what you'll see in those charts. So that if, for example, you only have wind speed data taken at 100 meters, but you need it for 125 meters, you can estimate how to adjust it. You'll also get some insight into why the power curves of wind turbines, those valiant industry workhorses, look the way they do. Not that we're teaching turbine design, but the stuff is interesting, and it's accessible enough at both an intuitive and light mathematical level. And it's foundational background knowledge if you're thinking about offshore wind. You might even end up surprised how basic it is, if you have the right data, to pretty much replicate, from first principles, the power curve, of the International Energy Agency spec for a 15 megawatt turbine. 15 megawatts, by the way, is the kind of size of turbine the industry will be deploying from the mid 2020s. But as for the main outcome of Unit 2, though, the single turbine AEP results you get from the turbine selection exercise, again, will feed the Unit 5 case study model, where they'll get scaled up to 100 or more turbines for a whole farm and then shaved down to account for power losses as we explain there. You'll see the resultant net total farm AEP that will drive your revenue line. That's what all the fuss here is about. <laughs>